Doug is a show that I personally have a really interesting relationship with. It's a show that I remember seeing a lot when I was a kid, and honestly, I didn't really like it at first. The first time I remember seeing Doug, I had to have been about five years old. Odds are, I probably saw it before that, but Baby Sean was a little too young to remember. It makes sense, though. I was super little, and Nickelodeon was airing cartoons like Cat Dog, Aw Real Monsters, Rocco's Modern Life, heck, even Rugrats. Those shows all boasted unique premises, bold characters, and had various styles of genuine comedy. For whatever reason though, my young brain just felt like Doug didn't have that. The first few times I saw Doug as a kid, I saw it as just a dry cartoon about a normal kid and the drama that he faces in his everyday life. However, that would change about a year later. I have a very specific memory from when I was about six years old, waking up one morning to get ready for school. I was in first grade, and my older sisters were in high school. High school starts a lot earlier in the morning than elementary school does, so naturally my sisters would be up and getting ready long before I would be awake. Every day I would wake up and my sisters would be finishing getting ready before heading off to school. I would wake up and say good morning to them, and they would have the TV on for some background noise while they get ready. Like clockwork, they almost always had it on Rap City on BET, which would play like the top rap and hip hop music videos at the time. Rap City. City. Or they would have it on MTV, which would be playing the top music videos in general usually, not all too dependent on the genre from what I recall. Being a six-year-old in the year 2000, naturally I had no interest at all in any music other than like Aaron Carter, so they would leave and immediately I would turn off MTV and put on some cartoons while I ate my cereal. Due to the network programming schedule, Doug would be on every single morning when my sisters left, which at first pissed me off the first few times. However, there was one specific episode that I would end up catching, and this episode would change my perception of Doug as a show. It's an episode that was very relatable to me at the time, and I'm glad I saw it because after that it became easier and easier for me to enjoy Doug and find some value in the show. Honestly, Nickelodeon's Doug was a fantastic cartoon in retrospect. It was one of the first three original Nicktoons alongside Rugrats and Ren and Stimpy. However, it unfortunately wouldn't be as popular as its counterparts. But that didn't stop Doug from leaving a lasting legacy on Nicktoons. That's why today, on our nostalgic walk down memory lane, we're going to check out the episode that made me like Doug. Doug vs. the Clotzoid Zombies. But first, you know, I wanted to say thank you so much for clicking on this video and for checking out my channel. Your support means the world to me. I wouldn't be where I'm at now if it wasn't for all of you guys, and I want you to know that you've all had a life-changing effect on me. I'm just so grateful to be here. I'm so grateful to have this platform where I can just put my content out for the world to see, and I'm even more grateful of the fact that you guys enjoy my content. So again, from the bottom of my heart, thanks for being here. This episode begins with school getting out in Bluffington. Doug and his best friend Skeeter are walking out of school. Doug asks Skeeter if he wants to grab some food from Honker Burger, and Skeeter agrees at first, saying that he's starving, but then this happens. Oh, here, Valentine! <laughs> come on, boy, come on! Uh, oops, uh, hey, uh, sorry, Doug, I, I forgot I've got other plans. Plans? Well, what plans? I, um, well, actually, I'm kind of going over to Roger's house. Uh, sorry, pal! <laughs> <laughs> Peter? Going to Roger's house? More kids walk by and Doug asks if they want to come over, but they also say that they're busy as they walk right over to Roger and Skeeter. Just then, Doug's crush, Patty Mayonnaise, who, fun fact, is voiced by Constance Shulman, who played Yoga Jones from Orange is the New Black, walks up and joins Roger and everyone. Hey guys! Oh no! Not Patty too! Hostile bye-bye, funny! Well, what's going on? Why is everyone going to Roger's house except me? Ah! 
That's me. We cut right on over to Doug's house as he's sitting on the porch talking to his dog, Porkchop, asking him if he has bad breath or if he did something to make everyone hate him. Doug admits that he feels like he's losing his friends and he isn't sure why. I bet Quail Man would know what to do if he lost his friends. The Adventures of Quail Man, the world's most quail-like superhero, and Quail Dog, his faithful quail-like friend. The story begins with Quail Man and Quail Dog facing their latest fearsome challenge. Stand back, Quail Dog! Come to find out that Quail Man's latest fearsome challenge is a mini golf course. As Quail Man continues to the next hole, he's approached by his kind, lovable neighbor, Mr. Dink, who wants to show Quail Man his latest invention. What is it? A remote controlled golf hole sensor? Nope. It's the old exploding golf ball! <laughs> oh, brother, what a loser! <laughs> That's funny. I've never known Mr. Dink to play practical jokes. Hmm. We then cut on over to the snack meteor where Quail Man and Quail Dog are refueling with some shakes. He walks up to the counter, which is being run by Patty Mayonnaise. Quail Man politely orders some beet shakes and she roasts him to a crisp and calls him a loser for basically no reason. She then says that they don't even sell beets there, as she offers him some zombie chips instead. Say there, Mosquito. Care to drop by the thicket of solitude for a rousing game of quail chess? I'd rather kiss a moving train than spend an afternoon with you, frail man. <laughs> oh, brother, what a loser. <laughs> yeah. We then cut on over to Quail Man's Thicket of Solitude. Quail Man is pacing back and forth, pondering about how all of his friends are acting strange, almost as if they're acting like his arch enemy, Dr. Klotzenstein. Meanwhile, Quail Dog is sitting nearby watching Wheel of Snacks on TV when this happens. Hi gang, I'm Dr. Klotzenstein, host of Wheel of Snacks. And you know, whenever I need a real hunger fix, I reach for a big old bag of zombie chips. <laughs> Dr. Klotzenstein, what the? Buy zombie chips. Go buy zombie chips with the secret zombie formula that will turn you into my zombie slaves. Quail Man tells Quail Dog not to look because he's being hypnotized, but it's too late. Quail Dog, with spirals in his eyes, starts walking towards the TV like a zombie. Quail Man acts fast and uses the quail call to make the TV screen literally just explode, ending the hypnotic spell that Dr. Klotzenstein put on Quail Dog. After that, Quail Man and Quail Dog fly off to go save their friends. They go right to Dr. Klotzenstein's lair where we see him with Assistant Vice Principal Bone strapped to a wheel. Dr. Klotzenstein pulls a lever and the wheel starts spinning incredibly fast as a crowd watches nearby. Just then, Quail Man shows up to put a stop to Dr. Klotzenstein's evil plan. Hmm. Say, Quail Man, ever been on TV before? TV? <laughs> Me? No way. So, all set to play our little game? Then let's play! Wheel of Snack <laughs> So, what snack food will you be playing for, Quail Man? Hmm. How about the spicy pork rollovers? Excellent choice! <laughs> the wheel begins spinning rapidly as Dr. Klotzenstein starts taunting him. The whole crowd joins in as they chant loser at Quail Man while him and Quail Dog are being spun mercilessly on the wheel. Quail Man laments in the fact that he's fell for the good old glamour of being a television star trick, as the evil doctor says that he's gonna turn everyone into his evil slaves now that Quail Man is out of the way. Quail Dog, your Quail Tail, it's our only chance!
As Dr. Klotzenstein is revealing his evil plan to create a theme park called Klotzland where they'll all work as his evil zombie slaves for the rest of their lives, Quail Man and Quail Dog show up flying above Dr. Klotzenstein with arms full of beets. That's right, Klotzenstein. Beets. The one food with enough bountiful, nutritious goodness to counteract the junk food additives in your zombie chips. Here, everyone, eat a beet and be free. That's right, friends. Beets. They're nature's candy, don't you know? The crowd eats their beets, and they end up being free of Dr. Klotzenstein's hypnotism. Skeeter approaches Quail Man, saying that he has no idea what happened or why he has beets on his breath. Once everyone realizes what happened, they all celebrate Quail Man as him and Quail Dog fly off into the night victorious. We then cut on back to the real world, where Doug is finishing up the comic that he's been drawing. He says that Quail Man didn't just mope around while Klotzenstein took over, and that he should take action like Quail Man did. Doug then runs right over to Roger's house with Porkchop. What do you want, funny? Listen, Roger, I want to know what's going on around here. Um, how come you invited all my friends over here and not me? Well, funny face, why don't you come in here and we'll talk about it. Mano e mano. Really? Uh, okay, Roger. Say, Roger, it's kind of dark in here. <laughs> Afraid of the dark, huh, funny? Oh, here, let me turn on a light. <laughs> Doug is super confused as he looks over to see a banner that says Doug's first year anniversary. He's surprised to find out that all of his friends, even Roger, his bully, planned a party to celebrate one year of him living in Bluffington. All this for me? Even you, Roger? Yeah, well, uh, hey, it doesn't mean we're getting married or anything. Hey, funny, is that mustard on your shirt? Huh? Ow! <laughs> <laughs> well, I guess it just goes to show you, you have to have faith in your friends, because true friends will never let you down. Hey, Doug, want some greasy puffs? Uh, no thanks. Now, this episode is such a good one in particular, but I want to start with the bigger picture first. There's a lot of amazing qualities to this show as a whole. First things first, I have to touch on Porkchop. He's such a good boy. He's loyal to Doug, he's helpful, he's funny. He's such a huge redeeming quality to this show, and it's kind of ironic considering that he doesn't even speak. That's another point in regards to the show, and again, how it's dedicated to being a show about a normal kid, his life, and the drama that he faces, mostly at school. There's no talking animals or anything that's outside the general scope of reality, really. It's a show that, for all intents and purposes, could have potentially been live action almost. I'm sure it would have flopped incredibly if it was live action, but the point being that the general basis for the show is rooted in real life. Sure, sometimes Porkchop does things that are outside of the scope of reality, but still, the general premise of the show is, for the most part, rooted in real life. As it pertains to Porkchop specifically, the fact that he's able to add so much quality and character to the show without even having to say a single word is a testament to how great of a character he is. I also have to bring up Quail Man and, of course, Quail Dog. Doug having an imaginary superhero alter ego really added a few layers of character to this show. As a six-year-old, seeing this episode and learning that Doug had a superhero alter ego increased my interest in the show tremendously. Of course, Quail Man wouldn't appear in every episode, but it's like seeing him in this episode planted the seed in my brain that told me that I should watch this show more. I remember watching this show not too often, but sometimes after seeing this episode, and I'm glad I did. There's a ton of fantastic episodes of this show, but the Quail Man episodes were always my favorite. Moving on from there though, the premise of Dr. Klotzenstein's plot is definitely something that I want to touch on. His goal, of course, was to enslave everyone and have them be his zombie servants at his Klotzland theme park, and all of it revolved around snacks and junk food for some reason, with all that circling around to beets being the cure in the end. I don't know what it is about this show, but there was always a massive amount of beat references. I feel almost as if they made this plot about junk food and snacks just as a way to circle around to beats somehow. Doug loves them, as evidenced by him ordering a beat shake at the snack meteor and his monologue about beats in the end. 
we would see many more Beat references throughout the series as well, most notably the rock band called The Beats, which was a play on The Beatles. I can't help but wonder if the creator of the show, Jim Jenkins, was a very health-conscious person, or if maybe someone else on the small team of writers was. Not only due to The Beats references, but also due to how much of this episode was about eating junk food. In the beginning, especially the whole sequence at the snack meteor where everyone is eating the chips, it's implied that the chips are what's causing people to go crazy. Patty Mayonnaise offers Quail Man a bag of zombie chips, and they make a point of emphasizing how the swirl on the bag matches the swirl in all the zombies' eyes. My adult mind wants to see this and connect dots, thinking that maybe they're trying to subliminally tell kids that if you eat too much junk food, then you'll turn into a zombie, though I will admit that if that's the case, then their subliminal messaging failed miserably because I I saw this as a kid, and it didn't really deter me from junk food even in the slightest. I also can't help but think that maybe it's a jab at like the big snack food corporations out there and how they make all their packaging shiny to entice children and make them want to eat all the colorful, pretty junk food that's going to make them not all too healthy in the long run. Another thing that I really wanted to point out that was just kind of odd is the fact that in the end, Quail Man shows up with beats to save everyone and all of these angry zombies who think he's a loser just agree to do it. They all happily munch on their beats without even batting an eye or insulting him along the way. Meanwhile, if you recall, back at the snack meteor, Quail Man ends up ordering a beet smoothie and Patty basically tore him a new one for it. She gave me the impression that the zombies hate basically any other food than junk food and Roger's zombie chips. It was really just a simple minor inconsistency that I just couldn't help but bring up. I'd think that if the zombies were so gung-ho for junk food, maybe they would put up more of a fight when offered beets, but hey, it is what it is, I guess. I do gotta say though, there's definitely more that I want to dig into that I enjoy about this episode. First of all, I definitely want to talk about the delivery of the premise for this episode. Essentially, the entire story being told is of a comic that Doug is in the process of drawing while he reflects on the situation with his friends and Roger. I love this just so much. When I was a little kid, I loved drawing comics. I would make up my own stories and characters as I just spent hours making pages upon pages of comics. I couldn't help but wonder if my love for drawing comics stemmed from seeing this episode at a very vulnerable age. Furthermore, the superhero theme in general involving Quail Man just added so much more substance for me as a kid. Whether it be Marvel or DC, I'm a huge fan of superheroes, and I have been since I was little, so it's not surprising to me that of all the episodes, this would be the one that draws me into Doug. I also really appreciated the fact that so much of this episode was about hypnotism. I don't know why, but I've always been super intrigued with hypnotism. When I was a kid, I remember trying for hours on end to hypnotize myself with a yo-yo swinging back and forth, Obviously not taking into consideration what happens if I were to be successful in my effort. I look back at that memory and I can't help but chuckle a little bit at the thought of my mom coming into my room to find me just like staring off into space having hypnotized myself or something stupid like that. Obviously that could never happen, but the idea of it is just funny to me. Moving on from there though, I have to talk about Quail Man's interaction with Skeeter, specifically when Skeeter was under Dr. Klotzoid's hypnotic spell. Quail Man tries to invite him to his thicket of solitude, and Skeeter replies with this. I'd rather kiss a moving train than spend an afternoon with you, Quail Man. <laughs> oh, brother, what a loser. <laughs> Not only did Skeeter literally say that he'd rather die than hang out with Doug, but he also proceeded to mop directly over Doug's shoes, which is a huge sign of disrespect. Honestly, I remember watching this show and loving Skeeter's friendly and bubbly demeanor, but this episode has me wanting more edgy Skeeter. Bring back the Skeeter that jokes about offing himself and roasts people. That's just the kind of spice that a show like Doug really needs. Also, just in case, I'm kidding, by the way. On a serious and real note though, this episode tackled a lot of very real feelings that can be hard to talk about for a lot of people, myself included. The feeling of thinking that you're losing all your friends is rough, especially at a young age. For those of us that weren't homeschooled, you know what it's like to go to school and have literally no friends at first. It takes time to make friends and find the group or build the group that you want to be a part of. When you're that young, the anxiety and worry of finding friends can be a hard thing to face. But if you are lucky enough to find that group of friends, and when you do, it feels so good. 
feeling like you finally found your place in school is a really just great feeling that honestly not everyone gets to experience. Throughout the 12 years that I was in school, I remember coming across a lot of kids who were more of the lone wolf type, whether it be by choice or not, and I was always the guy who would invite them to come hang out with my friends. My mom always taught me growing up that if you see someone who looks like they could use a friend, you should try to make friends with them, if you feel comfortable doing that, of course. That's a value that has made me a lot of really genuine friends over the years, and it resulted in those people making friends with my friends as well. Which is a good thing. It's a value that I've done my best of instilling in my own children, and when my daughter was in kindergarten before COVID, I remember her telling me all the time about the new friends that she made at school because she walked up to a kid who was just sitting by themselves. Kindness makes the world go round, and the feeling of spreading kindness to others is just so warm and cozy. Now, what Doug went through was interesting because, keep in mind, Doug still kind of is the new kid. He's only lived in Bluffington for a year now, and the first episode literally sets the foundation of Doug finding his place in Bluffington. Doug moved to a new town and started going to a new school that already had some pre-established friend groups. That's a really hard situation to find your place in. It's one thing when you're in kindergarten and you as well as all the other kids don't even know each other and you're all on an even playing field going blind into the situation. But Doug went into the school, tried to fit in, and did his best to make friends, and that he did. Which, mind you, can be no easy feat. However, the stress that Doug felt when he thought that he might be losing his friends was definitely a tough feeling for him. The fear of all your friends not wanting to hang out with you anymore is real, especially in Doug's situation where he feels as if his bully is purposefully stealing all of his friends. It's slightly obnoxious because people aren't property and you can't steal someone's friends, but you have to admit that the feeling of fear when it comes to people not wanting to hang out with you anymore is all too valid. The thing about this that's really messed up though, is the fact that a lot of people carry this fear throughout school age and growing up, but they don't realize that as soon as you graduate high school and become a member of adult society, that fear usually becomes true. Like, after high school, it's so hard to plan anything with anyone you used to hang out with all the time because of the conflicting work schedules and just life in general. Then, when you introduce real adulthood like spouses and children, it gets even worse. Like, you have a good potential to maintain friends as a single adult in my opinion, but when you have a child, so many people you used to hang out with lose interest in being your friend. Now, that's not always the case, but more often than not, having a child will definitely teach you who your real friends are. Personally, I feel like I've gotten really lucky in that regard. I have some pretty cool friends, and I'm happy to say that. This episode specifically is big though because it touched on feelings of social anxiety as well as rejection-sensitive dysphoria, though it didn't know it at the time, I'd imagine. Doug honestly had every right to feel the way that he felt as a result of his perceptions. His friends were acting shady and they were hanging out with Roger when they literally never hang out with Roger. It's just one of those things where they didn't do a very good job of hiding the fact that they had a secret and as a result, Doug's perceptions drove him to conclude that his friends just kind of didn't like him anymore and that they would rather hang out with Roger. Ultimately, as we saw, that would end up not being the case, but in all reality, we can't blame Doug for feeling the way that he felt. I will say though, there's so many episodes of shows that have touched on topics similar to this one. In this episode, it was an anniversary party and not Roger trying to steal Doug's friends. In other episodes of other shows though, there are straight up portrayals of people trying to steal other people's friends and part of me can't help but wonder if seeing stuff like that at such a young age resulted in us as kids growing up to have social anxiety and carry around the fear of something like this happening to us. Again, my conspiracy theorist brain can't help but go down the track of wondering if maybe, just maybe, the content we've been fed since a young age has had an imprint on the forming of our brains and influenced us into thinking a specific way, but instead of diving down that rabbit hole, I think we're just going to wrap up this video right here. 
So what do you think? Did you enjoy Doug as a kid? Do you think the government is force feeding us propaganda hidden in plain sight sneakily into programming that we digested as children and continue to digest as adults and as a result of that now we spend money frivolously on products that benefit them in an attempt to fit in and meet the societal norms that they try to force on us and imprint us starting from such a young age? Let me know in the comments down below. I always love seeing your guys' feedback. Of course, I need to give some love to my patrons, especially those people who are in the 90s kids tier. If you're on this list right here, you're one of my favorite people on this entire planet. And if you want to be on my list of favorite people on this planet, then check out my Patreon link down in the description box below. If you enjoyed this video, then do me a huge solid and share it with a friend and give praise to the YouTube algorithm in hopes that it pushes this video to everyone else. And as always, thank you so much for watching this video, and I'll see you all in the next one. Peace.